Manchester's indie rock and roll station. Excess Manchester. The Excess Manchester Long Player. An iconic album in full with Jim Salverson. Excess Manchester. Welcome to another Excess Long Player. Another classic album discussed in full with one of the people behind the album. And on this episode, it is Dan Haggis from the Wombats talking about the brilliant 2007 album Guide to Love, Loss and Desperation. A few times making this podcast, I've looked at the date of album releases and gone, how was that so long ago? 100% the case here. I couldn't believe this album came out 14 years ago. I'd also forgotten what an absolute banger it is. Tracks like Kill the Director, Moving to New York, Let's Dance to Joy Division, Back Throw at the Disco, all on this album and all discussed with Dan on today's podcast as well as some stories about the making of the album, his friendship with the rest of the band and some of the trials and tribulations as well. If you want to refresh your memory as to how this album sounds, have a look in the podcast description. I've stuck a link to the album on Spotify there so you can have a listen. And if you enjoy today's episode, episode or any of the other episodes in this series please make sure you follow make sure you rate make sure you review this podcast wherever you listen to it because not only does it give me a a little tickle of gratification but it also helps other people find the podcast enjoy today's excess long player this is dan haggis from the wombats talking about to give it its full title the wombat presents a guide to love loss and desperation How you doing, Dan? Yeah, good, thanks. Just uh, slowly cooking alive down in London. <laughs> yeah, we're recording this podcast in uh, a heat wave, and it's around 30 degrees right across the UK, which is probably a sign of a hellish future to come. But we'll try and put that to the back of our minds while we yeah. discuss a brilliant album from 2007, 14 years ago. Does it feel like that long ago, Dan? Wow. Yes and no. It's kind of like, you know, when you look back at a photo from when you were younger and you, you kind of like, wow, I can remember it as though it was yesterday. But then at the same time, you're like, oh, I have changed quite a bit since then. <laughs> but yeah, no, I I actually hadn't listened to the album all the way through for probably 10 years or so. And then recently there was like, a you know, that Tim's Twitter listening party that was yeah. our app, this album was on it. And so I put it on all the way through and had a couple of beers and I kept having moments of like, because we haven't done a gig for so long, it would get to like one of the songs and I'd be, my body was almost like sweating and like feeling, you know, like I wanted to play the drums so badly Mm. because my my mind was like, hang on a minute, when you hear this song, usually you're on stage playing. So loads of fond memories. And yeah, I still remember it as though it was yesterday. How did it feel going back with that level of separation, having taken a step back from it from 10 years and then hearing it for the first time again all the way through? Did it cause you to reflect on those songs in a bit of a different way? I suppose you do have a bit more distance, but um, as I say, you kind of just like plunge straight back into it. So for me, all the memories around the songs are kind of, this was the early days of our band and we were like driving up and down the country in my granny's old Vauxhall Aguila that she'd kindly loaned us. And, you know, we were just going and playing like gigs in front of anywhere between three and 40 people um, if we were lucky you know and it just brought back so many memories of that and getting back home from Glasgow at four in the morning and then having to get up for like our jobs and you know the next day and you get all of that stuff as well and then obviously all the gigs over the years of people singing along and kind of I don't know you just get the sense Mm. of like wow what a journey and how lucky we are to have that this that this album actually kind of has a played a part in some other people's lives rather than just our friends and family and our, our own. Were there any moments when you revisited it that kind of surprised you almost? Bits that you'd forgotten about where you went, oh, forgotten we did that there, or I can't believe we thought of to do that there. Uh, yeah, there was one bit actually at the end of Party in a Forest. It's kind of like this indie punk, like waltz kind of song. Mm. And when it gets to the end of that song, there's like this, we recorded the album in Rockfield down in Monmouth. And there was like, we'd set up, there was like a a reverb chamber on the other side of the courtyard because it's like an old converted farm. And we we all stood out in the courtyard, I remember, and it was like, as the sun was going down and Murph was playing this kind of like outro guitar part and just making loads of weird noises. And you hear at the end of that song, like the microphones were in the courtyard, capturing it coming back out of this like echo chamber thing. And we all just kind of laughed and like gave him a round of applause and we kept it on the album. And I was and I remembered it and had such a vivid image of it. So um, that was one of them. You mentioned Rockfield Studios. I mean, that is a studio with a huge history of producing many classic albums. I seem to remember, I think it was Manic Street Preachers told me a story about recording there. And there's a, there's a moo or something on one of their demo recordings because a cow kept on walking past the window or something along those lines. I forget the exact <laughs> story, but it is a building with huge heritage. It's a studio with huge heritage. Do you remember the feeling of doing your debut when you close your eyes 
that feeling of being told you've got a deal, you're making a debut album and it's going to be in a studio as legendary as Rockfield. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, you know, that's all any band wants, isn't it? Because we've done lots of recording and made demos and been in some studios in Liverpool and stuff. But then when we were told, you know, this is like a residential thing, you're going to be three weeks in the studio with the wonderful Steve Harris. And we were like, oh, my God, we didn't really know what to expect. And I think maybe because like, I don't know, we hadn't really Googled it that much. Um, (laughs) We didn't know what to expect. So we just turned up at this place like, right, where do we set up? And then we walked in and they were like, oh, that piano there, that's where um, they recorded Bohemian Rhapsody. You know, like Freddie Mercury actually played that piano. And then they're like, oh, that door there, Liam Gallagher tried to smash the door down to get his brother. And, you know, all these like proper music history kind of moments. Mm. And there was us little scousers like, whoa, (laughs) what the hell? How did we manage to end up here? Yeah, it's, um, you've obviously very quickly just got to like, soak in that little bit of music history and then just go right we're here to do what we want to do and have have a great time and there's no point getting too kind of overwhelmed or in awe of all that stuff because you've just got to very quickly we just made the album and got stuck in it was it was Mm. so much fun leading up to this moment the deal and the album and all that kind of thing you're a band that were very prominent on the liverpool music circuit playing a lot of the grassroots music venues as you say to varying crowds at varying times do you (laughs) think that kind of development of playing live so much fed into the album because it does have this energy about it i think this album do you think that comes from those experiences of playing live and kind of almost working out what made the crowd bop about i guess Oh, hundred percent. I mean, that was one thing when I listened through it recently was that it, well, I mean, I, I know it was cause we did it, but it's, it's literally like we wanted to capture the feeling of, of a live Wombats gig in a little room, just with all that energy. And as you say, people jumping around, like somehow our a and R guy, I remember at the time he was saying like, if we can somehow get the feeling that you get when you're watching the gig onto mm. a CD, then we'll be laughing. And that's what we tried to do. So we actually did play live without a click track, apart from on Little Miss Pipe Dream, because okay. we on that song, we wanted it to be just to keep it fairly steady. And also because we ended up with some like, Todd played some cello on there and we had like accordion and a few other things. I mean, when I say accordion, there was like an old accordion that had been in my dad's attic for years. And me and Murph, like I played one side of it and he played the other side because we didn't actually know how to do both. Um, but, you know, for that one, we wanted a few other things. But in general, it was just like off we go. And then we redid some of the vocals afterwards. It really is live, basically, which I think since then, obviously, you know, we've enjoyed the experience of like working on songs in a slightly different way. And I feel like the first album, because we did play so many gigs all around the place, the songs kind of a lot of the time from when we first made them to when we that maybe the 20th gig we'd done playing those songs they had morphed slightly mm. and, and they really get into your bones so it was kind of I don't know we didn't want to change anything you know it was like set in stone whereas I think later albums because you haven't really played them live very much if at all on some of them you know they're very much kind of malleable right up until the moment that they've mastered and you don't get that four year period of crafting either, do you, with albums? Suddenly it's a treadmill, it's a, it's a release live, write new album, release live, write new album. So by nature, I guess the process is going to be different. How did the process work in those years leading up to the debut in terms of creating albums? I mean, you are essentially the drummer in the band, but you hinted there playing the accordion. You do many <laughs> other things as well. I mean, you look at the credits that you have on the album, backing vocals, drums, synthesizers, piano, stylophone, harmonica, melodica, I think as well. So yeah. you're clearly more involved than just providing the beat. How does it work as a band in terms of the creative process or how did it work at this time? Yeah, I think to be honest, like all three of us, we all play multiple instruments anyway. Like when the band first started, I was like, depending on who we find, whether it's a bassist or a drummer, I would have just slotted in and played something else. But mm. Murph met Todd, you know, it fell into place. And I think all three of us always been kind of open to play whatever, whatever the song feel like it needs. With most of those songs, Murph would come in with a, either a guitar or on a keyboard, mostly a guitar on that first album, to be honest. The keyboards came in a bit later, but and would have like the bare bones of a song, sometimes missing like a break or a bridge or an outro or an intro. And, you know, it, but it'd be like, oh, this is what I've got moment what do you reckon and we'd go like yeah cool and we'd start jamming around the idea and then usually within the first hour or two something would come out of it and then we'd be like right we've got a a world for this song to live in and then we'd just hash it out uh, until it was done and add all the bvs and different any other melodic bits and 
And then usually, as I said as well, it would kind of morph throughout the, the gigging process and a few little things might change here and there. You know, you might do like a random fill one night that you go, oh, that worked really well. Or maybe there'd be a slight chord change or a little vocal thing that Murph would do that'd be like, oh no, this feels better. So yeah, things just got ironed out like that really mm. until organically we had this 13 songs that we were like, right, there's the album. And yeah, off we went. Did it actually feel like that? Was it a case of going, right, that's it, 13, tick, let's go. <laughs> Yeah, I, th- I was speaking to someone about this the other day. It's kind of strange how albums like come together. You know, we had lots of other songs as well that we have now released as like a B to Z sides kind of uh, little yeah collection of songs. But it felt as though like all those songs, again, from playing live, they were just the ones that we played the most and that we were regularly and had been for either up to a year or two or at least recently like the most excited about. And so there wasn't really any discussion, to be honest. I don't seem to remember right. about what which songs were going to be on the album. It was just like, well, yeah, I mean, this is it, isn't it? I'm going to ask you to pick a couple of moments off the album in a moment. And it could be your favourite songs. It could be moments. It could be stories that you remember from its recording. But there's a couple of tracks I just want to pull out, if that's OK, because I'm fascinated by the stories behind this. One is probably one I'm sure you get talked about all the time. Track number two off the album, Kill the Director, because there's various stories about the inspiration behind this song. The one that I think I like best is that you were all on holiday together and you were watching The Holiday with Cameron Diaz and Kate Winslet and you were so disgusted by it, it kind of inspired this song when the line Kill the Director. A, is that true? And is that also symptomatic of how the band write? Because I think this album sounds like it's it's lads having fun. And I get the feeling, listen to it, that it, it's full of stuff that would, would have made you guys laugh to yourselves at the time. And was that important to you to have this album that you just enjoyed making? So Kill the Director, we weren't on holiday together, but it was... I think Murph had gone to see that film in the cinema with his girlfriend at the time. Right. And I can't remember if they were like on the rocks or what was going on, you know, romantically. But I feel like it was kind of basically life is not, you know, what you see on the screens in a rom-com. You know, relationships are far more complicated than that. And there isn't always a happy ending. So I guess it was that kind of feeling with the song. And then with regards to then how the I think lyrically a lot of the time there are some humorous lines and and stuff in there but a lot of the time um I I feel like Murph's lyrics are often very like confessional and relating to things that have actually happened you know he's always struggled with like mental health issues so that side of his psyche kind of comes out in the songs and then I feel like the band and like the the music and like the practices we used to have and stuff especially when we were younger but like still that's our time to like have a laugh and have fun you know in the same way that you go to a a pub to have a few pints with your mates it was like we'd be in a practice room sometimes with beer sometimes without but you know and we'd just be like having fun and just enjoying it and like if it started feeling like it was especially on the first album as well it was just such high energy and we were so we were always like so excited when we were playing music with each other I think we just egged each other on and like you know that sense of discovery and like making something from that wasn't there before like all those things just feed into this kind of like Rah! like <laughs> and, and listening back as well to most of those songs it's just like it's so high energy and so fast it's like our 70 year old selves are going to be really cursing our 20 year old selves when we play that when we're older. Interesting you mention Murph's lyrics there because I happen to think Murph is a hugely underrated lyricist. I think he's incredibly clever with the way he writes and the way he uses language. And I wasn't going to mention this here, but it seems appropriate. You'll have to excuse this. So I apologize in advance because I found the old enemy review of this album. And I wanted to read you a bit of it. I don't know if you remember this. I don't know if you even paid notice to it at the time. But I wanted to read it to you and see if I could get your reaction to this. Because I'll be honest with you, it wasn't hugely complimentary at the time. So the enemy review (laughs) read, Their frenetic, thumping indie package appears to be gurningly stupid and painted with the kind of lyrics normally found on the inside of a GCSE notebook. It's both a blessing and a curse for the Liverpool band. Did you pay much attention to reviews like that at the time? Not me personally. I, I mean, I remember the NME. It was always a kind of like Marmite. We were a Marmite band for them. It was so weird. Um, well, you know, the NME just some... had a go at anyone, didn't they? Anyone who weren't excruciatingly cool, <laughs> they would have a Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that was the thing. So we definitely were never cool. And in a way, you know, we didn't really have any a style as such. And I don't feel like we were ever very easy to like put into a category or a box or whatever. To me, it doesn't it doesn't feel like like some of the lyrics are tongue in cheek. So maybe I can see some of those things, but 
again, a lot of them, I feel like a very, yeah, I, I, I do feel like Murph's got like a sort of poeticism and like mm. a, a, a turn of phrase that is definitely unique to him. And I just feel like that's developed over the years and mm. yeah, but again, you can't, you can't really listen to like critics and stuff. You know, it's, that's not going to help anyone have a good night's sleep. <laughs> And everyone's entitled to their opinions and it's fine. You just move on. And as musicians, all you can ever do is just express yourself and hope that somewhere out there, you know, you connect to someone and make someone feel something or they can relate to it or whatever. And for critics who listen to like 15 albums a day or whatever, then, you know, if they feel like having an easy dig at you, then that's fine. The other track that I wanted to just have a quick look at was Dr. Susan Mattox, PhD, which is a great name for a track of an album. Incredibly (laughs) unique as well. There's elements of, in the chorus of this, there's elements of Help Me Ronda by the Beach Boys. I'm a huge Beach Boys fan. So oh, yeah. is, is that one of the bands that, which, which I have to confess, I'd never particularly heard huge Beach Boy influences in your music until I kind of considered that track. And are they one of the bands that fed into the influences on this album? And, and also, did you worry about potential rights clearances at the point of recording that? Or did you kind of go, we'll whack it in and see what happens? <laughs> Well, yeah, good spot. Um, yeah, we, we, we all absolutely love the Beach Boys. I mean, harmonies wise, definitely. And that was always one of the kind of, I mean, them and the Beatles and stuff, you know, I, I'd actually, I was in a, um, in a sort of covers band when I was like 16, 17, and we used to play at weddings and various things. And that's where I learned to like sing and play the drums. So for me, it was always kind of a very natural thing. And, and, that, and I've always, I played in like a folk trio and used to do three part harmonies all the time. So for me in the Wombats, it was always like, I just, I just always tried to like pack as many harmonies in as possible in the right places and stuff. But, you know, I love that side of things. And mm. I think there's other ones like here comes the anxiety on that album, you know, it gets to the chorus and there's like me and Todd do lots of Beatles, like call and response, like, and, 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 Be- and beach boys kind of thing. Mm. Um, and there's like with the stylophone, like following some of the ooh lines and, you know, the way the Beach Boys like layer multiple sounds onto some of the like, ooh, 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 you know, those kind of things. But they yeah. have like instruments, like multiple instruments doing the same thing to the point where you're not really sure what instrument is playing it. As a youngster, I just always found that kind of stuff so fascinating, like the production side of things. And I was just like, wow, that's so cool. So I think personally, we've all, we co-produce everything we do. And that's definitely something that I love. I always love trying to get those moments into songs and like in Kill the Directors that like, um, do, do, did, and did, 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 to me, that's really Beach Boys as, as well. It's like a little wink at the Beach Boys. So there is definitely elements on there. But again, most people would listen to the our first album and just be like, the Beach Boys, what are you on about? You know, because <laughs> on the surface, it's just like this gnarly little terrier dog kind of snapping at your heels. But <laughs> Dr. Seuss, I remember Murph's dad always used to say that when we played it live. He was like, oh, I just love those like Beach Boysy harmonies on that one. But yeah. Uh, I'm really glad that you noticed that because I don't actually think I've ever heard anyone say, like, mention that reference. But yeah, it's definitely there and it was in our minds. Although the Help Me Ronda thing wasn't actually, like, that was not a reference for that. Um, Okay. Now that you say, help me, Susan, help help me, Ron. Theirs is swung. Whereas ours is, like, straight. So straight away, I think a musicologist would be like, hmm. Yeah, we're not going to sue you. (laughs) Not going to worry the lawyers too much. (laughs) No, no, no. Bro, well, that's a couple of my highlights from the album, a couple of things I wanted to talk about. Uh, What about you? What what on this album do you remember so clearly like it was yesterday? Which bits of music within it do you love? Oh, wow. Well, I I think um, the the opening of the album, the a cappella, I remember like we did that first in Todd's flat on Rodney Street in Liverpool and... As soon as we'd done it, it kind of, I feel like I remember Murph like coming round a little bit later. Me and Todd had like started messing around with this thing. And we were like, oh, what about doing an acapella thing? And then we all just like worked on it until it was done. And then it just felt like, right, that's the start of our gigs from now on. I remember us standing in the in the studio next to the piano that Freddie Mercury played on. And uh, yeah, we were, we did it, you know, Steve had us doing it like five or six times. And I remember we just, we did it one time and we all looked at each other and we were like, oh, I think that was it. And he was like, yeah, got it, guys. And that was, you know, it was literally just a live thing. So that was a memory that just popped in. Um, Did it feel like a brave thing to do at the time, starting an album with that? Because normally albums, particularly at this particular time when there weren't that many concept albums out there, it was kind of indie albums were 
pretty formulaic. It was kind of, you start with your big song, second single, maybe third on the album. It was like, you, you front load it, but here you're doing something where you're starting with something a little bit left field. Yeah, actually, there's an, that's a barbershop kind of thing. I guess that's another probably Beach Boysy um, influence. The a cappella initially, I thought we were going to start the album with Kill the Director because it kind of feels like, as you say, that's a good number number one track that's just mm. like out the gate. But then, do you remember like on some albums, like in the 90s, you, you could rewind the CD and then you'd get to like a hidden track. Yeah, yeah. We were thinking about doing that for the a cappella. And then I think after a while, I think it was Murph actually just went, oh, come on, we're not, we're not hiding this. Like we start the shows with it. Let's just be bold and start the album with it. And we were like, really? Yeah, sod it. Why not? So yeah, that was that. And then I'm trying to think of other moments. As I said before, like Little Miss Pipe Dream was definitely a standout track on there just for how different it felt for us and how much space there is in there. And like the keyboards on that are little Toys R Us kids keyboards, like these little Casios. And we used to cart them all around the, the country and then, you know, later on when we were touring that album, we'd literally be on planes around the world with our Casio keyboards, all of us with one under our arm each because we couldn't check it in because it would get broken. And it was just so like DIY. And that also felt like it summed us up pretty well. And they had these dodgy little connections, like mini tracks in the back, I remember. When you love a single like that, when you love a track off the album, like Little Miss Pipe Dream that you talk of so fondly, do you get disappointed if it's not then picked as one of the singles to come off that album? Not not with that song, because, I mean, I just I don't think that ever had a chance of being a single. Mm. It was definitely like a bit of a fan favourite at gigs, probably because everyone could have a breather for three or four minutes. Um, <laughs> you know, especially me on the drums. I was always like, oh, we, you know, if there was ever any talk of not playing that one in a set, I'd just be like, honestly, guys, I, my arms are going to fall off. I had like tendonitis at the time. So, you know, repetitive strain injury. So that was like a must for me in the set. Over the years, we've had that where bands and, and ourselves especially are really bad at knowing when a song's going to be a single or not. You've just got to kind of throw the songs into the mix and hope, let the labels decide most of the time. We've definitely been like, I remember with Jump Into The Fog on the second album, we were like, surely that's a single. And at first the label were like, no, it's going to be a good album track, but we're not sure. And then it did end up being a single. And But it's, you know, it's just a lottery. You've just got to be happy with all of the songs mm -hmm. and then it's up to them. Um, other songs, yeah, Here Comes the Anxiety. That's another sort of standout one, I think. And a little nugget for that one at the end of the song, because here comes the love anxiety, it's going to grab a hold of me. Just like last time. And then there's a big, massive, like, piano hit. And that was, like, we were, that was our little wink to the being from Liverpool and the, the Beatles, like, day in the life, you know, the big, the famous kind of, I can't remember how many times they hit the, uh, the piano, but it's, like, 30 times or something like that. And there's this huge, big, like, smash of a piano chord at the end of it and the harmonics just like go on and on and on for ages and so we we did that at the end of that one how do you feel about this album now dan now we are 14 years since its creation when you look back on a guide to love loss and desperation do you think it stands up i mean we've obviously nailed our colors to the mast by featuring it on our classic album show so you know how we feel about it do you feel <laughs> the same way well first of all many thanks for that that's uh <laughs> means it means a lot yeah i it's, I don't think as a band, I just, you know, having been so involved in the whole process, it's kind of, for me, it really is like looking at an old photo book that there's so many memories attached to it. I don't know how I could ever be objective or, mm. you know, I don't know. It's like, it's been such a soundtrack of our lives and it's, it opened so many doors for us and it took us on this journey that's kind of still going um, as a band with my friends. You know, it's sort of, it's really hard to, and in my family as well, you know, like so many of those songs, like we used to, when we were making them and rehearsing and stuff, my little brother would be waiting outside the door and then singing it at dinner. And, you know, all these little things that kind of, it doesn't even feel like an album almost. It's like this living entity that is just, it's, like, I, I just, it's really hard to explain. So I wouldn't know how to say whether it's stood up against other albums or it hasn't. Um, but you haven't got that it, separation. No, for me, it's just like, it's the album we made and I would have no regrets for any of it because... You know, I just loved making it and the whole experience was just so fun. And, I, you know, I just wouldn't change anything. So for me, it's like it is what it is and it, it's out there for people to make their mind up about. You're still together with the other guys in the Wombats. You're still making music. I think there's a, is there, there's a new album on the way, isn't there? Pretty There soon. is, yeah. We, we recorded it, um, yeah, during lockdown, which was uh, an experience. What's the secret? How come you guys have managed to stay together making music when so many of your 
peers at that time have kind of fallen by the wayside with a few notable exceptions but in general there aren't mm. that many bands from that era particularly still going today yeah good question I, um i mean i think a lot of the time like all, all three of us from the very beginning were just so determined you know that we would just make it work somehow and keep going you know we've been lucky enough that we've we haven't had to get like a another job as it were and i don't know every time we get together and make music and record and tour and it's like of course we have our difficult moments you know every band and every family and every friendship does but in general i think we just it's always like the greater good of the band kind of comes first regardless of any little tips or tats here and there it's kind of come on we want to be doing this in 10 years time and there's never been an issue really with that and then in terms of making the making music i think also we've pretty much whether listeners would agree or not we've always tried to do something slightly different from album to album and you know our big influences are like beach boys and like bands like radiohead you know that you never know what to expect from their albums and you feel like they're kind of charting new territories and like looking to be as creative as possible and make new things and that 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 sense of like as i said before like discovering new music that all of a sudden you're like wow this feels like nothing i've ever quite heard before and whether that's only in our heads and not actually true it doesn't really matter you know it's kind of for us each album has been like different mm. and you've just got to feel like it's you play music don't you so we still manage to make it feel like it's kind of playtime and we're, we're exploring and um you know i hope we just keep getting to explore <laughs> Well, with that in mind, look forward to hearing the latest evolution from the Wombats when the new album arrives. Do we have a release date yet? Do we know when it's going to be available? That announcement will be made in August. Okay, so that, that might be in the past or the present, depending on when people are listen, listening to this. Oh, yeah, true. <laughs> August twenty, August 2021, because um, we had to push we had, we had to push things back because of COVID a little bit. So, um, yeah, but it's, it's, it's on its way. Bro, we'll look forward to hearing it, Dan. Really nice to speak to you about a brilliant album. And thanks loads for your time on the XS Manchester Long Player. Nice one. Thanks for having me. The Access Manchester Long Player, an iconic album in full with Jim Salverson. Access Manchester. Boom! We're done. Cheers to your ears. If you like today's episode with Dan Haggis talking about the Wombat's debut album, then I reckon you're going to like, well, probably a few other episodes in this series. But definitely have a listen to the Pigeon Detectives talking about I Will Wait, their debut album. Similar vibes, similar eras. That's a brilliant episode as well. Thank you very much for listening to this podcast. Please do rate, review and follow it wherever you listen to podcasts. Some great shows still to come over the coming weeks and some brilliant albums discussed in full on the next Excess Manchester Long Play. Manchester's indie rock and roll station. Excess Manchester.